Welcome to Module 5 of Orthoepidemiology, Diagnostic Test Characteristics, Part 1. Integral to the practice of medicine is using diagnostic tests. Similarly, in research methodology, it is important to understand characteristics of a test that make it more or less useful for your purposes. Collectively, these qualities are known as operating characteristics of tests and typically include sensitivity, specificity, and positive and negative predictive value. Other qualities of a diagnostic test or algorithm involve its reproducibility or reliability, its validity, does a test measure what it's supposed to, along with its accuracy and precision. These are all important factors to consider when picking a diagnostic test for a patient or utilizing a diagnostic test to draw inferences in research. For this first part, we will be discussing validity, reliability, accuracy, and precision. Validity. Validity is the cornerstone of the utility of diagnostic testing. The most important factor potentially in a diagnostic test is whether it actually measures what it's supposed to measure, whether it is a valid measure of that diagnosis. In research, validity is typically broken down into internal versus external validity. Internal validity is effectively the same question within the context of the research study. That is, how well do the data support the conclusion within the context of the experiment? I.e., how well does the study measure what it's supposed to measure? Many things go into this, but most have to do with bias, confounding, and chance. So roughly, internal validity can increase with higher level of evidence studies. However, even in observational studies, significant steps can be taken to protect the internal validity of the study. Many of these were discussed in the last module on protection from bias. External validity, on the other hand, is inferential. How well does the data correlate with the population as a whole? It can be thought of as the in vivo to internal validities in vitro for those who prefer basic science. External validity depends on inclusion and exclusion criteria, sample distribution relative to the population as a whole, and sample size slash presence of outliers. In diagnostic tests, surveys, or patient reported outcome instruments, there are different types of validity. There are three major types of validity discussed when discussing instruments such as surveys. The first is construct validity, and likely this type of validity underpins all the others. That is to say, how well does the test measure what it is supposed to measure? How well does the DASH score measure upper extremity function? How well does an IQ test measure intelligence? This type is maybe the hardest to prove since it is trying to measure adherence to a certain theory, and as such, the construct or test may perform better in some scenarios than others. This is particularly true when the test enters different cultures. For example, suppose you were designing an assessment of knee function. In floor sitting cultures, the amount of knee flexion needed is greater than in cultures where this is not an important factor in life. In such a culture, not having a large amount of knee flexion may be more of a functional limitation than in a culture such as ours where floor sitting is not integral to our way of life. Content validity asks the question whether or not all the facets of what's being measured are assessed within the instrument. In orthopedics, this may hamper patient reported outcomes within certain populations. For example, running may be a good item to have content-wise in a lower extremity assessment of younger patients, but for elderly patients, the construct may not need to have questions regarding running. Criterion validity typically compares a novel construct against a gold standard to assess how well the construct measures when compared to the gold standard test. This type of validity is often broken down into concurrent and predictive validity. Face validity is the weakest form. It simply states that something seems like it's valid. As a malus maleficarium proved in the Salem witch trials, face validity is a very poor form of validity and even potentially dangerous. When speaking of tests, you can look at the degree to which they are similar, or you can look at the degree to which they are different between raters. As opposed to comparing externally to a gold standard test, you are comparing what two raters would do given a similar set of instructions. When speaking of similarity, you can look at studies of agreement, how similar raters rate the same subjects. These are reliability studies. You can look at measures of dispersion, or how different measures are by magnitude using measurements like mean difference. Can you substitute one measure from one technique for another? How good is a measure at being similar between raters within the same rater across multiple time points? 
Reliability is effectively a measure of how repeatable a test is. This is a measurement of similarity between multiple raters or across multiple times with the same rater. Inter-rater is how good the measure is at being similar between two raters. Intra-rater is how good the measure is at being similar for the same rater at two points in time. Outside of strict percent agreement, two of the most common ways of assessing agreement are Cohen's kappa and intra-class correlation coefficient. Cohen's kappa tends to be useful for categorical or binary inputs and carries the advantage that it takes into account that agreement could occur by chance alone. When generating a kappa, the output can be between zero or no agreement to one perfect agreement. Intra-class correlation coefficient tends to work well for continuous variables as it generates a correlation. It does so under the assumption that the values in each class or group are similar, rather than pairwise as in strict correlation. Many options exist to tailor ICC to a specific research question. In general, kappa, ICC, and other measures give a value between zero and one as previously mentioned. Although it has been said there is no universally acceptable kappa, that has not stopped authors from trying to define degrees of acceptability. Likely the most famous was Landis and Koch's 1977 paper, which used the values which appear on the slide. This paper is widely used, but has been criticized because it supplies no evidence, but rather bases the recommendations on personal opinion. Fleiss later developed guidelines that were equally arbitrary. Without getting too far in the weeds of ICC, when deciding which ICC you want to use, you first have to choose the model which you wish to use. This can be either a mixed or random effects model. Random effects models are usually preferable if one is attempting to make inferences about the general population of raters, which is typically the case in most studies of agreement of a measurement in surgery. Next, you will determine the type of model. Most often you will be interested in difference from average, or mean of K raters as it is described in statistical software. But less frequently, you may also be interested in comparing the measurement to a single rater if that rater is more experienced, for example, and you are trying to compare less experienced raters. As far as the definition, you will be either interested in how often does x equal y, or absolute agreement, whereas consistency between raters allows for some degree of error, i.e. how often does x equal y plus or minus some degree of error. Average agreement can be assessed between different raters or between different rating systems testing for the same thing by fitting a line or doing a linear regression. Dispersion can then be tested by checking the residual from that line. Residuals are the distance of the actual observations from the best fit line or ordinary least squares line or regression line. Consider for example the pictures on the slide. The left picture are average measurements of pelvic obliquity using two different techniques with patients whose spines are in coronal balance. The OLS line fits quite well and the residuals are quite small. On the right, we see a case of pelvic obliquity measurements using two different measurements in patients with unbalanced spines. The OLS line fits less well and the residuals are larger, indicating a larger degree of dispersion. While kappa and ICC assess agreement between measures, Mean difference assesses for average difference between measurements. In a similar way to how standard deviation or variance is a measure of dispersion and mean and median are measures of central tendency. These are useful to assess how two different techniques are at measuring the same thing, assuming they use the same units or the units can be normalized as to similar units. Accuracy and precision are often discussed in reference to diagnostic tests. An analogous concept is systematic versus random error. Accuracy is a measure of how good a test is at measuring the true estimate. This is often difficult to know, and so accuracy of a test is based on a gold standard. This is why the highest level of diagnostic studies are based on a comparison to a consistently applied reference gold standard. The gold standard is the closest known approximation to the true disease status. Poor accuracy can lead to systematic error. Precision, on the other hand, is how good a test is at obtaining the same result each time for a given subject, kind of like the test's intra-rater reliability. As such, if a test has poor precision, it can result in random error. The picture on the left is me shooting a bow. I am neither accurate nor precise. We can see a grid on the right. If I hit a bullseye every time, I'm precise and accurate. 
If I have good grouping, but I'm always missing the bullseye, I am precise, but inaccurate. I have systematic error. If I have poor grouping, but hit around the bullseye, hitting it occasionally, I am accurate, but imprecise. There is random error. And if I have neither, I have a poor test, or I'm a poor archer. If you have questions, please leave them in the comments section below.